Hello, I am Nuno Carvalho, and today I'll be explaining what a genome-wide association study is. The quick summary is that a genome-wide association study, or a GWAS for short, is the discovery of associations between certain variations in our genetic code and a certain physical trait. To explain how all of this can be done, we must begin at the start with an explanation of single nucleotide polymorphisms. All of humans' genetic code is called the genome. In the nucleus of each cell, the genome is split between 23 pairs of chromosomes. Our DNA is made up of an extremely long chain of connected single units called nucleotides, which come in four forms, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. These variations are often shortened to A, T, G, and C, respectively. Incredibly, humans share 99.9% .9 of their genetic makeup meaning only 0.1% of our entire DNA is responsible for the diversity we see between individuals. So, let's say we choose a spot along our DNA and find that 95% of people have an A nucleotide here, while the remaining 5% have a T nucleotide. Each of these forms is called a variant. Given that this location on human DNA can have multiple forms, it is dubbed a single nucleotide polymorphism, or a SNP for short. These SNPs are key in understanding the genetic causes for human traits. While some traits, such as what LA-based NVA team you prefer, are almost entirely environmental, other traits, like eye color, are extremely heritable. SNPs can help us understand to what extent certain traits are genetic, as well as what biological mechanisms in our body might be affecting those traits. To do this, an association analysis can be performed. Let's pretend that we are trying to find genetic associations with BMI, meaning we're trying to figure out what variants in our DNA might be impacting BMI, such as genes that might increase or decrease the efficiency of metabolism in our body. We first need a large sample size of volunteers, at least in the thousands, but preferably closer to hundreds of thousands. This cohort of people should ideally be of identical ethnicities to minimize confounding genetic variation from other factors. Then, each person needs to be genotyped or have their nucleotides recorded at many known SNP locations. Often, each person will have genetic information recorded for over 2 million SNPs. After that, we need to record each person's BMI. Once we have recorded the genome and the trait, or phenotype, of a large number of people, an association between the two can be computed. The next steps involve using a genome-wide association analysis program. A commonly used software for this is called Plink. Using the software, some quality control filters can be performed on the genetic data set, removing any individuals or SNPs that may have faulty information. Next, the actual association analysis is done. For every SNP in the data set, a regression analysis is performed, with each individual being a data point. For example, let's say the program is performing a regression analysis for SNP ID number 1, which has two possible alleles, an A and a T. Each individual in the data set then has the number of T alleles they have in their genome for that SNP plotted against the physical trait of interest, in this case, BMI. Keep in mind that human DNA contains a copy from our father and a copy from our mother, meaning that a person's allele combinations for the SNP can be AA, AT, or TT. This would be coded as a 0, A1, and a 2, respectively. Once each individual is plotted, the program tries to draw a line to the data that best predicts the relationship between the number of alleles and the phenotype. If there is no association between that SNP and BMI, the regression line would essentially be a horizontal line. However, if an association is present, you can expect the regression line to have some sort of slope. The effectiveness of the line at predicting the data points determines the p-value. The p-value is a measure of the likelihood that the association found in the distribution of data points was due to random chance, given that there is no association between the SNP and BMI. This means, the stronger the data points cluster around a sloped regression line, the less likely it is that it is due to random chance, producing a small p-value. For each SNP, the p-value calculated is recorded, as well as the slope of the regression line, which is also known as the effect size. This regression analysis repeats for every single SNP in the data set. When you are working with millions of SNPs, this will often take hours, if not days, for a computer to accomplish. Luckily, programs like Plink can take advantage of efficient processing, such as multi-threading, to finish the analysis quicker. Furthermore, these programs allow for the addition of covariates, which are other traits that may affect the phenotype that is of interest. So, for example, 
the amount of exercise done weekly by a person certainly has an effect on BMI. So, if this information is present for the people in the data set, the regression analysis can also account for the effect of this covariate when it competes the effect of the genotype alone. Once p-values have been calculated for all SNPs, how do we determine if an association is considered significant or not? Once again, this has to do with p-values. You might have heard before of using 5% as a threshold for statistical significance. This means that only results producing p-values lower than 0.05 are considered to be due to a real association present and not random chance. However, with a p-value of 0.05, you still have a 5% chance of producing a false positive, meaning around 5% of your significant results may still be because of random chance. When you are working with millions of SNPs, you are likely to produce thousands of false positives, which can muddle results and diminish the statistical power of your study. So, a Bonferroni correction is performed, which transforms the threshold required for achieving significance by taking the typical 0.05 threshold and dividing it by the number of SNPs in the analysis. The quantitative genomics field has adopted 5 times 10 to the negative 8 as the default threshold for significance. This will sharply reduce how many SNPs find a significant association with the phenotype, but chances are that most of those SNPs were false positives to begin with. To visualize these results, a Manhattan plot is produced. A Manhattan plot takes each SNP and plots its position along the chromosome on the x-axis and its associated p-value on the y-axis. The p-value undergoes a negative log transformation to make it easier to read. Essentially, dots above this line represent SNPs that are significantly associated with BMI. Often, significant SNPs will be clustered together due to linkage disequilibrium, a topic beyond the scope of this video. But what is important is that these clusters need to be analyzed using SNP databases that indicate what genes are present for those regions. Identifying gene locations associated with the phenotype may uncover important biological mechanisms that had not been found before. With these findings, the prevention and treatment of certain genetic diseases may improve drastically and hopefully many lives can be saved in the future. Thank you for watching this video. If you have any suggestions for a quantitative genomics topic for me to explain, let me know in the comments. I'm Nuno Carvalho, and I hope that you have a good day.